Hello, and here and now is the first and only recorded interview with Christine Jorgensen. Uh, Miss Jorgensen, or may I call you Christine? Please do, Mr. Russell. Are you a woman? That's a very good question. We seem to assume that every person is either a man or a woman. But we don't take into account this true scientific value that each person is actually both in varying degrees. Now, uh, this sounds a little evasive, and I don't mean it to be, when in all actuality, my only answer to that is that I am more of a woman than I am a man. I see. Speaking from a medical and a physiological standpoint, do you have female organs? In my particular case, let me explain it this way, that uh, under the various tests and examinations that I have encountered, it is believed by my doctors that somewhere within my body these organs exist, or part of them exist. The ovarian uh, tissue? You yes, mean? due to chemical results that they have gotten. There is nothing definite in there, and of course at several times there have been people who said, even medical people who said, well, why not undergo an exploratory operation? But as one of my doctors said, it's utterly preposterous to think that one should undergo such an operation of this kind simply to satisfy a newspaper. And he's perfectly right. No ethical medical man would perform this uh, as a proof. Just that for it that means reason, nothing. you mean. I see. If you should see a girl, an exceedingly curvaceous, beautiful, seductively appearing woman, say of the Marilyn Monroe variety, do you ever wish that you could go back and be a man? No, quite to the contrary. I think uh, when I see a beautiful woman or a beautiful man or a beautiful anything, mm -hmm. I am, of course, most attracted by beauty, as most people are. What I mean is, are you ever sexually drawn to a woman? Have you ever seen a woman that you would like for your woman, for your love mate? No, not at all. Never in my life. Even I... when you were a man? No. How about that? Never. Mm -mm. During uh, your tour of duty with the uh, armed forces, I'm quite sure, it, as happened in most barracks, the fellas talked a good deal about girls, about their romantic conquests, or their romantic desires, as it were. How did this talk affect you since th at the time, and even now, you had no inclination toward sexual attraction to women? Well, I tell you, uh, that I recall very vaguely as being... It didn't bother me one way or the other. Of course, I, I had no place in it. I sort of moved away. Ah, it embarrassed me a little bit, I might say. But there wasn't that much of it, you see. Oh. Be, and plus, people have very vivid imaginations <laughs> about my army career. Oh. I was in for 14 months after the war ended. Oh. And I was stationed at Fort Dix, New Jersey. No guns, no cannons, no walking through the mud or yeah. anything. And most people have these vivid impressions that I was traipsing around Europe and landing at Anzio and so forth, which wasn't true. Well, most people think because uh, the uh, transformation took place overseas that it, they tie that in. They can't separate the time, your army service and your, and your operation. So they s feel that it all happened in Europe. Oh, no, it's quite the opposite. I went into the army in um, August of 1945. War had ended in June, I believe. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I was in working in discharge work at Fort Dix. Then I got out in December 1946. I went to Europe for my treatments in 1950, so there was at least four years in between where uh, I went to college and to photographic school and so forth. I want to ask you a question about uh, your entry into the Army. There's that uh, long, drawn-out physical examination on going into the Army. With your definite feminine tendencies and inclinations, were you embarrassed uh, by the doctors, or how did you feel in the presence of the other scores of nude men that went through with you? Did you have any sensitivity toward the men? No, I suppose mostly acute embarrassment, because uh, I have always lived somewhat of a prudish and sheltered life. 
And I always still say that I'm the type that when there's no one in the apartment, I lock the bathroom door while I'm bathing. Yeah, I know. You know, even when the apartment's (laughs) empty. So uh, it's just a force of habit, I suppose, to live close within myself as I did for so many years. There is known or rather thought to be such a thing as a hermaphrodite. Uh, Are you familiar with this? type of being? Well, I asked my doctor not very long ago what actually is the word hermaphrodite, uh, because I was under the impression that almost every human being was, to some extent, a hermaphrodite. And he said, yes, uh, they probably are, except that the hermaphrodite tends more to the actual genital organs of both sexes. If one person has the genital organs of both sexes, then that was called a pseudo-hermaphrodite. Whereas intersexuality, which is another term he used, means that there is a preponderance of one sex, but there is also the other sex. So every person is basically an intersexual. But a hermaphrodite uh, deals mainly with the genitalia and not the uh, genetics, nor the hormonal, nor the uh, psyche. Is a... Is your transformation or operation then now complete, or is there a prognosis as yet undetermined? No, the the prognosis is determined uh, physically. My uh, operations and treatments are all complete. But, of course, uh, I can never have any children. But uh, this, of course, does not connotate that I cannot have natural sexual intercourse. I am very much in the position right now of a woman who has a hysterectomy. Then shall we dance? (laughs) (laughs) When you go into a women's restroom, do women feel that there is a man among them, or do they feel... How do they feel about your presence? Do they accept you as merely another woman? Oh, very... Quite definitely so. In fact, they usually try to get me into conversation, you know, just to sit and have a few minutes chat. But, of course, uh, to me, there is very, very little sex in toilets. (laughs) Uh, There has been much written and said about the development, synthetically or mechanically, of hormones. Do you take hormones? Yes, I take hormones, but I do not take them too regularly. It's always a good idea to take rest periods, but of course hormones should only be taken under the guidance of a qualified physician. Have you observed or experienced that hormones do develop certain portions of the body in a feminine way? Oh, definitely. Well, you see the male hormone and the female hormone work, of course, in their own directions. The male hormone on males and female on females. And uh, of course your body contours are determined a great deal or uh, I could almost say exclusively by your hormones. I'm very small built in all manners. Well, many women in the theatrical world, or women in general for that matter, use padding to accentuate certain portions of the body. Are you upholstered in any way? (laughs) Yes, I use padding, and more so on stage. When you put on a dress that weighs about 25 or 30 pounds, uh, it would do terrible things to your to your bust measurement <laughs> with all that weight hanging on you. Mm-hmm. And plus, do you know the average woman? I believe statistics will follow this out. We're going through a period now of being so bust conscious that there are many many women developing complexes about their inadequate bust supply. Yeah. And they're trying to, to go in for this plastic surgery and yeah, this building yeah, up, and it's yeah. all a very, from what I understood, a very dangerous proposition. It, uh, you are without a doubt the world's most publicized person. Now, has the fame, the notoriety, the sensationalism, or however you prefer to term it, upset you, or how have you reacted? Well, my first reaction in December, which was December 1st, 1952, was, of course, great, great shock and surprise that actually anyone was very much interested in what had happened in my life time went on, I realized that uh, this was sort of an important step yes. in the eyes of the world. I see. Although my life uh, happenings or those happenings in Europe were completed, I knew that there were many others who may or may not be available for such treatment. I'm looking at a headline in the New York Daily News, which says, G.I. 
becomes beautiful blonde. Well, I think it's very complimentary in a sense, but uh, sometimes it's a little irritating to have XGI come as a tag before anything that anyone does. It seems to connotate in some manner that there was something wrong with being an XGI, <laughs> which is quite untrue. <laughs> I got news there. Well, there were plenty of things wrong. <laughs> well, um, many people believe that it was a love interest that motivated your intense wish to be a woman, and they are therefore somewhat surprised and a bit nonplussed that no romance or no marriage has developed. What have you to say to this? Well, love to me is many different things. Uh, <coughs> I believe in my lifetime I've been very lucky. I have loved very sincerely twice, uh, neither of which have ever culminated in marriage. And no. uh, I think I've been more than lucky with my share of it. But when a love interest did have some uh, effect on my desire to go to Europe and clear up this whole situation, simply because uh, I love life much too much to have lived a half-life. I see. When you say you have loved twice in life, was either time as a man or were both times as a woman or well uh, perhaps we'll say dressed as a man <laughs> rather than as a man <laughs> because i was very far from ever being a somewhat complete male uh, have uh, you had plastic surgery of any kind yes i had an operation in denmark not on my face but on my ears strangely enough Yes, I had very, very outstanding ears, and I had a, developed a great complex about it, to the point where I didn't like to have people standing in back of me, because I remember in childhood it being referred to as a taxi cab with the doors open. <laughs> and this developed some sort of complexes within me, and I know what you mean. while I was in Europe, there was, I met a very fine plastic surgeon, and he just looked at them, and he said, at my ears, and he said, oh, this is nothing, this is very simple operation you come to the clinic and have it done and you go home the same day and i thought this is too good to be true yeah and i went and i did it and he was perfectly right and one day i was home again were you interested in the theater before your transformation well i would say interested in the theater yes i suppose i was unknowingly so because having worked all of my actually working years from uh, young adulthood to the time i went to europe was involved with photographic work, magazine covers, and with the motion picture industry. So I'm inclined to think now that all of this was a substitution for being in front of the public's eye. That it, realizing my position at the time, I knew I couldn't be in front of the public eye, so I wanted to work in back of the cameras. Do you attract basically a homosexual audience? No, not at all, although uh, one sometimes doesn't know the people in the audience, or how many of each varying type of person are there. But I'd say in general, I attract mainly a middle-aged uh, husband and wife type of people, which seems in striking the, uh, to many people. In the trade, in the, by the trade I mean in the entertainment profession, are many of your friends homosexuals? Yes, I would say they're in the entertainment field there is a great uh, predominance, I believe, of homosexuality, which, of course, is probably the reason why some of these performers are such good performers and so sensitive because of their own personal, uh, shall we call them problems or, or ways of thinking. I was just about to use the term problem and ask you, how do you feel about the problem of homosexuality? Well, I don't personally believe that homosexuality is a problem to society in any way or form because uh, it is too often misconstrued that all sorts of sex perverts, and by this I mean child molesting and this type of thing, are homosexual, which is utterly ridiculous. Any good psychiatrist will throw that idea out of the window. Of course, a pervert can be homosexual, but it is not a, a necessary uh, thing that he should be. But as far as I'm concerned, and I believe that the world of homosexuality in no way affects society or harms society and the only way it could would be if everyone became homosexual and there was no more uh, birth rate well some time ago in washington dc there was what uh, i would like to now refer as a purge of 
known homosexuals from strategic jobs in uh, Washington. Yes, I the read about that. The reason being, they thought that anyone with homosexual inclinations was vulnerable from a standpoint of blackmail and could therefore be very easily induced to reveal vital statistics and uh, government classified matters. So with that thought in mind, would you like to continue this belief that uh, well, homosexuality is not a problem? Well, it is. I don't believe it is a problem. It is a social society's way of thinking toward homosexuality, which is the problem. It's not ho homosexuality per se. Again, uh, these men or these women, I don't know, there's homosexuality in both. True. Uh, they are v in a vulnerable position if they are handling secret documents and so forth because of the constant fear of social ostracism. Uh, another question here. Most men, to most men, the height of hilarity is to get dressed in women's clothes at parties and at different affairs. It's just funny to see a man put on women's clothes and walk out, especially if he tries to wear the high-heeled shoes. How do you feel in women's clothes? Well, very comfortable, but I must say that clothes are simply uh, a side issue. One isn't born to wear clothes, actually. Uh, clothes is a habit that one accumulates. Oh, well, back to nature, huh? Na back to nature, definitely. You can't <laughs> say the average woman's foot is made for high heels because it isn't. Do you think that what has happened to you could be a panacea for all those who are, shall we say, maladjusted in their present state of sexual existence? It's very difficult to use any individual as a panacea for, the, for a mass. My life and the happenings within it can be used somewhat as a guide by medical men, but not by the individual patients, because each one is an individual, and each case is a separate case. Has the public, when I say the public, have uh, individuals from the public been unkind to you? Have they thrown snide and nasty remarks, perhaps not directly to you, but within earshot? shouted things from the crowd that have been uh, upsetting or depressing. Has this happened in any of your experiences? Actually, very, very seldom. Being in a nightclub where drinks are being served, and of course where drinks are served, you will invariably find a drunk. Right. Uh, male and female, and may I al also say that a woman drunk is worse than a man. Usually, uh, never in front of me. Mm -hmm. Things come back to me from others, but very, very seldom has anyone ever approached me face to face with any sort of a comment which was of a derogatory nature. Quite to the contrary, I receive many, many compliments after my shows, which even surprises me. Have you ever been, uh, I suppose about the most charitable way I can put it, is propositioned as most women in show business are at some time or other? Most women in the world have been at some time or other, and I have too. How do, how do the fellows approach you? I mean, how do they, what do they say? Can you recall any instance when a guy has really tried to make a date with you? Well, actually, uh, I've been approached in, in a very nice way most times. In fact, I can't remember of a time when it wasn't very charming, when some gentleman very seriously comes up and said, would you sit down and have a drink with me? I should like very much to meet with you and talk with you. And... Many times, of course, there's a problem involved, that mm. they're sort of searching for answers. But other times, it's nothing. It's just simply they would like me to sit with them, and sometimes I do. Have men of the wolf variety ever pawed you or touched you or tried to? Some have tried, yes. I had an experience in South America where I was passing through a big group of people, and uh, someone made a grab for me, but several other people jumped in between, and the police and so forth, and that solved that problem right there. Then I assume that uh, before your operation, your uh, genital organs were as the normal male genitals would be. Well, not as the normal male genitals will, would be because it was an immaturity, of course, in my case, mm -hmm. as my whole body was immature. Uh, it, well, I was not developed either properly physically, sexually, mm -hmm. and probably not emotionally either. I noticed that your hands are tiny, your feet are small as a woman's feet would be, and long, graceful fingers, many of the feminine, char feminine characteristics, 
The features are clean cut. The jawline is unhard, as man's would be. And I guess all of this goes to make up what made you know that you were primarily a woman. A great deal of that, but you know, the strange part of it is people have an idea that I'm a very big boned type person again. I'm only a size 10 in a dress which is very small for my height. Well, while we're dealing in statistics, how tall are you? I'm five foot six and a half inches without heels. And what is your weight? Oh, about 120. I wish it were 130. I have the negative uh, problem. Most women have problem losing weight. I have problem gaining it. Now, many people think what you did was a marvelous scientific thing, an inspirational thing. Many think it was disgusting, sickening, done for a cheap uh, expose in the, in the same sense that many sexual perverts are exhibitionists. What do you think of that? What's your reaction to this? Well, the first uh, part of your question there is I am deeply gratified with people thinking that this was a, a wonderful thing. Uh, it was a part of my life I can neither see it as a wonderful nor as a very tragic thing. It is simply something I had to live through for my own happiness and my own adjustment. Consequently, I see very little courage there. And as for the second part, I believe it's an immaturity concerning any idea or any connotation of sex. Oh. Because uh, one can hardly make lurid tales out of about two years of constant everyday examination, hormonal examination, and three operations. It's hardly sexy. <laughs> I can understand that. Uh, it's on record that you received the greatest amount of mail and the greatest amount of journalistic coverage in the history of civilization. Were some of your letters insulting? Did people say smutty things? Oh, wait a minute, you've got things? three questions there. Yes. Uh, it's not true. I have not received the greatest amount of mail. I believe that the average Hollywood star receives a great deal more mail. Uh, what you are referring to by the greatest coverage that refers back to Idlewild Airport in New York. I see. Where uh, my arrival had the greatest coverage in the history of Idlewild. I see. Which was true, and believe me, when I looked out the window of the plane, quite unsuspecting that anyone was going to be there to meet me. Oh, you didn't know this? No, uh, I, I did no not know it at all. And consequently, when I saw it, I almost became panicky. But at that moment, I just decided, well... Just pull yourself together. This, as everything else, must pass. What did they say to you, and can you remember any comment on your part at this time? Well, I walked down the steps of the aeroplane. It was very, very funny. And I had several coats over my arms and little packages and so forth. And when I read the next day that a woman reporter had said she teetered and tottered in the high heels on the aeroplane steps... I laughed and said, yes, I certainly did teeter and totter. I was loaded down with all these things, and no one stepped forward to help me with them. And if you've ever been down an airplane step, you know that to a degree they are a little uh, movable, you know, they vibrate. Well, to the other part of my question about the mail that you did receive, were any of the letters insulting, or were they humorous, did they poke fun, or what were they like? Actually, very few were insulting, much less than I had anticipated. I received thousands and thousands of letters from problems, from people, people with, with problems, problems. Uh, with the very, very flattering attitude that in some way I could help them. And I only wish that I were capable of helping all these people who did look to me for some sort of answer or guidance. Then there was an equal number of just congratulatory notes, and one of the most beautiful parts of it was that a lot of these notes were sent not to me, but to my parents. Oh. Very charming letters, and uh, just very, very sweet. And my mother was quite overcome by the fact that so many people thought of her and my mm. father. And then, of course, there was what you call the derogatory notes. I would say that I received about, oh, maybe 40 or... 30 of them. I'm and told. that's a very small percentage when you think in terms of 20 or 30,000 letters. Yes, indeed. One of the letters was written by a very unhappy boy. <laughs> he must have been 
and it had a razor blade and it said why don't you cut your throat uh you're making it hard for the rest of us us that's what his interpretation was the rest of us uh, what us was i don't know but as i said to my doctors not long after that i've discussed this since with some psychiatrists that it would hardly solve this young man's problem or i to disappear off the face of the earth mm-hmm. it would mean nothing it would not uh, change his problem one iota well maybe to him you were a symbolism of uh, it can be done shall i or shall i not do it this Probably. is quite possible but i believe that this was more of a person who had uh, direct neurotic tendencies which my psychiatrist i got this from him this is not my own psychoanalysis since you mentioned it, your mother and father received considerable mail and congratulatory messages how did they feel are they proud of you or are they ashamed of you or are they unaffected uh i would be inclined to think that they are proud of me i i couldn't say off hand i'm quite sure they are we have a very close family relationship and but also a relationship where we don't very much discuss uh whether they are or not they seem to show it in action rather than in word how long did you contemplate this problem uh, to summon the courage and that's what most people consider it courage to go through with it i can imagine there were many ch- chances to turn back uh, many times when you were somewhat doubtful shall i or shall i not uh, the trip over there entailed some time and the waiting and the medical preparation for the transformation did you ever think about it up until you got to the point of no return as it were my point of no return i believe began from the first waking moment that i realized i was different mm-hmm. there's a very very big problem in the world with any child who has to live with the thought of being different because we all sort of want to be a part of the group this is a great great fight i think of each individual's fight for survival is to be wanted to be needed to be part of the mass and when an individual is segregated out of that by themselves many times by their own emotional conflicts it sort of leaves them standing alone so consequently when my whole thought went on to the betterment of my life and there was no turning back there was no uh point at which i wanted to turn back although of course physically there were many points i would not have died had i not had this treatment i see i'd have gone on existing but i would hardly have gone on living well the type of person you are you would probably have adjusted it was a matter of adaptation to i believe that i would have receded completely into myself have you ever had psychoanalysis well during my treatments in europe there was of course a psychiatrist involved in the case completely mm-hmm. but after it was all over and I, even after the publicity broke quite unbeknownst to me my psychiatrist called me at the hospital the day after the story broke and when i heard him on the other end of the phone i heard his voice was very serious and so i laughed and i said well um don't worry i'm not going to have a nervous breakdown huh. and then he laughed and he said you know chris this is the only point at which i was frightened he said i thought you've been so basic all the way up through the whole treatment your understanding of what was happening your acceptance of what was happening your happiness and all of this that i thought perhaps this one moment of this great notoriety suddenly falling down upon you might be the moment of breaking point i see uh christine have you had any sincere entreaties for a romantic interlude well it's uh difficult to determine what's sincere i have uh a case full of letters of proposal proposal from men i i've never met oh. and of course i have had many proposals from men i do know and i'm highly flattered by it i think the average woman gets this many in their lifetime but i don't know somehow or other i don't take any of it too seriously just now i guess it, mr right hasn't come along yet is there any special man in your life now is there any love interest in your life now as of this moment no there is no love interest but there is great friendship i have uh several men i'm very very fond of uh no and perhaps one, one day i'll marry i don't know i don't think i'm ready for marriage no to be perfectly honest with you 
It says here in this paper, Christine Band in Boston. Oh, yes. It's not a wonderful headline. Well, how so? Well, it's not really wonderful. It's just that it seems to be a very running joke, let's put it that way. Yeah. That anything, any book or film or person or anything that's banned in Boston is an immediate success, mm -hmm. which, of course, isn't true. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very funny experience in Boston, which, of course, I think is that area is just much too prudish. You think and it's a sincere prudity? Yeah. No, it isn't a sincere prudity. It's a very false prudity. Uh, because it's utterly preposterous to be banned before you have even appeared. <laughs> As I said to the journalist when I arrived, I said, well, this is very charming. I said, but they don't have the vaguest idea what I do on stage. And, of course, my act has always been uh, very carefully screened so that it doesn't About taste. your act, what do you actually do? Well, I sing... Off? A little bit. I talk, I philosophize, I have some very uh, clever material that's been written for me. Oh, special material? Special material. Oh. And then I have a very big wardrobe <coughs> set up. I have a beautiful screen on stage, and I make four clothes changes in, in one number. I just keep going behind the screen and coming out with completely different wardrobe. Well, what, uh, what sustains the interest of the audience while you're... Uh... I'm still talking to them. I have a microphone behind the screen. I'm looking oh. over the top. So they see my head at all times, and then now suddenly I come out with a completely different outfit on. I see. And, of course, the women usually start an applause because women love clothes. When an audience is watching you perform, do you think they're examining the merit of what you're saying or dancing or doing? Or in the back of their minds, do you think they're looking at you as, as a freak attraction? Well, there can be little doubt that there is a a great part of my audience does have that attitude. Uh, fortunately, they have it when they come in. And from what I've heard from club owners, that they seem to have a slightly different attitude when they go out. They feel well, little... That's very good. I suppose just having seen me, it's... I imagine in some respects it's uh, like seeing the third party of a triple personality hmm. because people have only seen newspaper pictures of me and then suddenly they discover that I... Have color, <laughs> you know. I can understand that. If you see everything in a black and white and suddenly see it in color, then it's something different. But again, curiosity. Curiosity is very important, and we're all curious. Anyone who says, are you a curiosity attraction, I will say yes. Because I also am curious. I'm curious about many things, from Sputnik down. I think Jimmy Durante gave me the best answer. And when I first started in the business, I couldn't understand. I told a few jokes, very nice jokes, but I didn't get any response from the audience. And I remember the evening he looked at me and he said, you know, Christine, he said, you could tell the funniest joke ever written on stage the first 15 minutes of your act, and you won't get a laugh. Why? He said, because they're too busy looking at you. I see. And this I understand and accept. To sum it up, actually, Mr. Russell, the curiosity idea is that if I saw Miss Garbo mm. going down the street, I, too, would love to peek under the hat. <laughs> but, of course, I wouldn't do it. I don't think I would anyway, but it would take all of my strength not to. Christine, do you think the time will ever come when your complete past, or at least this episode in your life, will disappear when people will think of you as Christine Jorgensen? photographer or Christine Jorgensen actress or whatever your pursuits might be at that time and not as Christine Jorgensen woman formerly man no Mr. Russell I don't think the time will ever really come when the past as I as you say Christine Jorgensen formerly a man will ever be forgotten should any event come up in my life such as my marriage or even my death the newspapers would have a Roman holiday and rehash the whole past. But the strange part of it is, is that the people who know me know me a very short time, and they forget about the past. Recently, I was talking to a friend who's also in the theatrical world, and we were talking about childhood. And she was referring to hers, and I was referring to mine. And then all of a sudden, she looked at me, she said, you know, Chris, I forgot. That you were a boy when you were a child or recognized as uh. such. And uh, so I said, well, you know, Kay, I haven't forgotten it because it's part of my past and it's, it's what makes me the person I am today. And it goes even so far as in my home as hanging a picture mm. taken of me when I was six years old. 
It's still hanging on the wall in my mother and dad's bedroom. I am not against speaking or thinking of my past and even my friends. What about hair distribution on your body? Well, I've always been rather hairless, although I did have what you might call a mustache problem. Did you have the facial hairs removed? Yes, uh uh-huh, and I still have to go every once in a while if one or two reoccur. You mean permanently removed? Yes, with electrolysis. And when I first started it, there's another very interesting point. When I first started going, I was terribly shy about it. And uh, one day, Madame, who is a a Viennese uh, doctor, Mm. she was very fabulous with a great concept of living in life. She said, you know, Christine, I want you to meet another patient of mine. And this poor woman had hair all over her body. Yeah. And she says, now you see how easy, how simple was your problem. She says, I have women coming in here every day, she says, with such psychological problems because they feel it's unfeminine, and which to a degree it is, but it should never destroy anyone's life. A woman who has the problem should go and have it taken care of, and it can be taken care of. What about the jokes, the Christine Jorgensen jokes that have gone the rounds of nightclubs and uh, oh, there comic have books been many. throughout the world? <laughs> How have these uh, affected you? Have they, have they? Have you heard most of them? Well, I don't know whether I've heard most of them. I've heard an awful lot of them. Yeah. And of course, uh, frequently when I'm in a nightclub, I go unannounced. Yeah. And I can still hear uh, comedians using them on stage when they don't realize I'm in the audience. <laughs> and <laughs> afterward, recall they any, disappear. Any them? <laughs> yes, I recall. I think the cleverest one I've ever heard. And I must say, I thought it was a brilliant mind that figured it out was at Fort Dix, New Jersey, where, of course, as I have just said, I was for 14 months. The soldiers looking at the newspaper with an enormous headline and my picture on it, and they just sighed and said, now she tells us. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a little later. (laughs) Which I think has a very, it's a very clever one. Um, Denmark has another connotation in the minds of many Americans, I know. I'm not sure how it affects other people, but... uh, in a sense, you have made Denmark a famous landmark on the world map. And the Danish people, how did they react to you? How did they, they feel about you? You honor me much too much. I don't believe that Denmark needed me to make it famous. It was very famous for its blue cheese before that, you know, right. among other things, and its smörgåsbord. But uh, Denmark, to me, is a wonderful, very charming country where I found a great deal of happiness... Of course, being an American, I was first and foremost an American. This is why I returned. My family, my ties, most of my important items in my life were here. But in Denmark, I have many wonderful friends. You know, they call it the Paris of the North. Yes, I've I've heard that. And it really is. It is the most charming country, and if in any way I have been able to help build the Danish name in the world of of other countries, I feel very honored. What did they think about it? Well, the Danes have a very philosophical attitude about life, being a little country and sort of unable to control world situations. They sort of sit back and accept what comes, which is carried over into their everyday living. Mm. And even the journalists in Denmark, when the story first came out, they came to me and they said, Miss Jorgensen, really, we don't need this for our people. We've already said what we had to say yesterday, but the American newspapers insist upon these stories. Yes. Uh, I uh, think their uh, general attitude would be, what is everyone getting so excited about, which right. is my attitude, too. Could you tell us anything about what happened during the operation? Were you asleep? Or were you? Uh, oh, yes, I was asleep. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But a very strong constitution. I wake up screaming for food. <laughs> yes. When you... Um, when the operation was complete, do you know what disposition was made of uh, the parts that were removed? have no idea. I think any, any hospital would be able to give you a better idea of what happens to a leg that has been removed yes. or any other. Uh-huh. Since this was such a famous thing, I, I, I thought it might have been preserved, preserved rather. For oh, no, well, no I would hardly think so. It's possible, but yeah. I don't know. Are you considered in the world of entertainment by the stripper burlesque element as a much desired attraction? Have you ever been sought by the uh, 
I have been asked to appear in several burlesque theaters in that type of thing, but I don't think this... Uh, I, w- I don't think I'd be very good there. Mm-hmm. I have nothing against burlesque, uh, except that I think it's rather uninteresting, personally, but I can understand someone else's attitude that, of enjoying it. Have you ever been approached by a movie company with a sta- from the standpoint yes, of Yes, I've been approached several times. But unfortunately, all of those approaches have come with... Uh, the attitude of, once we have you, we'll figure something out for you to do. I see. Which I think is the negative approach. Yeah. I believe that if a motion picture company had a story and they felt that I, as a type, would be good for it, mm-hmm. I could go along with that. But Maybe I they'd want to do the story of your life, the Christine Jorgensen story, which is very much being done now. The, you know, I don't think I would be the best person to do it. I may be a little too close. I, I don't know. Well, do you think any other actor, once having played Christine Jorgensen, could ever portray any other role on the screen? Well, I don't see why not. Uh, It would depend very much on how the film was done. If the film was done badly, the actress may never appear again on screen. (laughs) And I think it would be an actress that would have to play it rather than an actor. Are there any movies of questionable nature in print at the the moment based on this thing? Yes, there are several. There are several which, unfortunately, use my name in the advertising, which has absolutely nothing to do with my sanction. I have never sanctioned or permitted it, but it exists, and it's always one jump ahead of me, if you (laughs) understand what I mean. I keep appearing in a town, and then they said, well, two weeks ago, there was your picture was here. And I said, I have no picture. I know that there is a uh, dreadful Frankenstein-like picture of a d- doctor who does uh, hocus pocus oh. and changes a man <laughs> into a woman. and But this is hardly the story of my life as it is proclaimed to be. What about your plans for the future? Do you plan to continue as an artist to develop your talent so that you more or less dissolve into the pattern of entertainment? Or uh, have you other plans? Do you plan to go back into photography or...? Well, photography is still part of my first love. See. And... Uh, My photographic work I keep doing privately. Now? I I have big albums of pictures. Everywhere I go, I take photographs and motion pictures. In fact, the other night, we were sitting looking at hours of coronation pictures I filmed while I was over there. Oh, you were there at the coronation? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. It was the most fabulous spectacle and deeply religious uh, procession I have ever seen. Did you ever meet any royalty? Yes, I have met the King and Queen of Denmark. Oh? Did you ever meet any famous theatrical personalities or people from the sports world or people from the fourth estate, the journalistic world? Any oh, yes. Names? Oh, yes. I can, I'm very, very lucky. I think I can count most of the columnists, Walter Winchell, High Gardner, Dorothy Kilgallen, among my friends. Oh, well. And acquaintances, maybe not terribly close friends because we don't know each other that well, but... I uh, see. Oh, yes, constantly meet theatrical people. I love the theater, and I love theatrical people. About children, do you have any younger brothers or sisters? I have an older sister and and two little nieces. Two little ones? What mm-hmm. ages are they? Seven and five. Now, let's think ahead to the years when they will be probably 17 and 15. How will you feel, and what will you say if they should come to you and say, Aunt Chris... We heard at school today that you were once a man. Well, uh, this can hardly happen at the age of 17 because it happened at the age of seven. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) uh, My oldest niece approached my sister with it. Of course, we assumed that once she started school, that problem would come up. And I think anticipating the problem, as in all cases of anticipating problems, they seem much larger than when it actually comes about. And she came home one day, and she said very sweetly, she said, Mommy, uh, she said, I can a little boy be a little girl? And so, of course, my sister immediately realized what had happened. Yes. And she said, yes, in some cases, uh, this can happen. That is when a little mistake has been made. And so my little niece said, well, do we know anybody like that? And my sister said, yes. She said, Auntie Chris was like that. And so my little niece said, fine. 
And she went away, and now it's, she knows it. Yes. And the little one will probably get it from her. Oh, but definitely. You, you use the word mistake. Uh, apparently, many people in uh, our civilization think that nature made mistakes. People are constantly having their noses changed, their faces lifted. So could uh, your transformation be considered an improvement on nature? Well, you see, it's, it's our form of society which first and foremost creates the idea of it being a mistake because society has decreed that there are men and there are women and it's very very difficult as i said before for them to accept the scientific value that people both men and women are bo both sexes the most any man or woman can be is 80 percent masculine or feminine in your scrapbook here i see um, articles and clippings from newspapers and magazines and in languages that are totally mysterious to me, this looks to me to be like Chinese. Is it from China or No, it, Japanese? it's uh, Japanese from Honolulu. Have you been around the world? I know the news of the Christine Jorgensen story has been around the world. Yes, the story, I believe, the story of my life, originally printed by the American Weekly, uh, has been, I believe, in 79 or 80 countries. So uh, I didn't know there were that many countries. <laughs> Probably you know? some countries that you didn't even know existed. I got fan mail from uh, French Equatorial Africa and from various uh, cities and areas which I never even heard about before. But this picture shows you in ballet costume. Were you doing an act in ballet? Yes, this was an act that I had to give up because the audience took it seriously. Oh. It was a comedy routine on... Uh, Upon my entrance into show business, I'll give you a very short rundown. Mm -hmm. Upon my entrance into show business, I couldn't decide what to do. So I met a singer, and she said, well, you must sing. So then I attempted to sing. And with a falsetto <laughs> voice did Madame Butterfly one fine day. Wow. Which I thought was very funny. Yeah. But the audience took it seriously. And then the next step was, well, the singing didn't succeed, so someone told me to dance. So then I danced in the ballet outfit. And the fact that I could run around the stage on toes made everyone think I was a ballerina. <laughs> and after I came off stage, they said, well, you dance very well and you sing very well. And I thought, well, the whole point of what I was trying to was do, lost. because I couldn't do either of them you very well. You were doing well. a burlesque of it and they took it to be... Precisely. They took it so seriously that I had to drop it from the act. Show business has been a lucrative thing with you, has it not? We generally led to believe that you've made thousands and thousands of dollars from personal appearances. And I have made a great deal of money, a great deal. And fortunately, uh, I've been able to have a home for my parents and protect my own life just a little bit. But people misunderstand when they read these great sums that a performer receives because they assume that they just simply take that sum and place it into their little safety deposit box or into their pocket, and that's it. They forget that with each performer, there is a whole organization. Uh, agents, managers, public relations, transportation, hotels... So one can well readily see how that money can be eaten up, a great percentage of it. And then, of course, we don't work every week. So the week we don't work, we've got to cut last week's salary in half. I see. And six weeks out of work, and, well, you, it's only a sixth each week. I see what you mean. Well, this has been a very interesting interview. It's the only first... It's the first and only recorded interview with you, Christine Jorgensen. And it's unlikely that we've answered all the questions that people would like to know, and it's unlikely that we've covered every phase of the topic. And it's equally unlikely that you've covered them all in your magazine articles. you have any plans for further recording your experiences in this regard? Well, I should like to. Um, basically, I'm very much interested in finding out what people are anxious to know, because I believe that perhaps in some way a mother with a child that she feels may have a problem, may not know just what to do about it. And not that I would know what to do, but I try as often as I can to direct people to the doctors whom I know and trust and, and believe in, mm -hmm. who can perhaps give them an answer so that they're not walking in the dark with, with problems. Are you presently writing anything, texts or yes. guides? Yes. I have just completed my autobiography, and it shall be published in the near future. And in it, I, of course, have exposed my whole life, my feelings, my emotions. It was a very difficult task because an autobiography is very challenging because you want to be objective. 
And if you say too many things about I and keep using I, I get a little embarrassed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe I'm not that important. I, maybe I shouldn't be discussing I, but a, an autobiography is I. So consequently, in the writing of my book, the greatest problem was to examine every fact and every happening and say to myself, have I interpreted as I want it to be or as it really was? And I wanted the book to be as it really was. Therefore, it's taken me four or five years to write the book. Thank you, Christine Jorgensen, and may I say this has been, in the very least, illuminating. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell, and I do appreciate the chance to speak to you. <laughs>